Kanta Palabashi Parababa, Rebre Paraba Kaduati Balabashi Bra Parababa, Rebaraka Palabalababa, Rabra Parapa Palabalababa, Rebro Parapalabasi Zose Duati Te Palabasha Papa Papa Papa, Rabra Parabaka Palabasi Zebra Parababa, Leba Gibodwa Sibra Parabasha Parababa, Rebre Parabaka Palabazu Zebra Palabasha Parababa. Wherever you are, my brothers and my sisters, lift up your voice. We thank God for another day, for another opportunity to meet today, to um, spend some time in the Word. Just lift up your voice. Bless the name of the Lord. Thank Him. Clear your minds of everything that you are thinking of. Pray right now and edify yourself. For the Bible says that when we speak in an unknown tongue, we edify, we charge ourselves up. Right now, begin to charge yourself up wherever you are. In your car, in your home, in your office, lift up your voice and begin to pray right now. <speaking in Hebrew> Lift up your voice and pray. Kadwata palaba swazi barianda. Rabra palaba swazi balaba shapa rababa. Rebre paraba kapalaba suze bra panta palaba shapa bababa. Lebra paraba kapalaba lande. Rebre pa. Leba suze bra. Lema sheba bababa. Kabada balaba ria parababa. Rebre paraba katwata palaba shiba rababanda. Rabra parapa kapalaba labala. Leba lebo suse palaba shipala bashi palaba. Rendo kadwati pra parababa. Mene mane mosize bla palaba shipa rababa. Rapa palaba kadabada badanda. Lepe pelebo suse pre parabalaba shim. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Rabra papa laba suze prepa. Laba laba shapa papa pa. Ya badele bade bale bada bale bada bale. Ye paderwa si zebra pa. Raba laba shepa. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank God for another day. We are gathered together to spend some time in the word. My brothers and my sisters, wherever you are, I want you to just copy the link of this particular mess, of this particular video. Share to your brothers, your sisters, your family. Let them know that we are about to spend a few minutes in the Word of God. Thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity. This is our Renew Your Mind service or our Kingdom Mindset service. And we are welcome once again. Hallelujah. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I thank God for the grace of God upon our Father, Apostle Kingsley J. Godson, all the ordained men of God, Prophet Hefo, Reverend Linda, Reverend Della, Reverend Andrew, Reverend Roland, Reverend Robin, Reverend Beryl, Reverend Chris, Reverend Bright, Reverend Selassie, Reverend Anna, Reverend Gabby, Reverend Sami, and all of them, all of them, wherever they are, Reverend Keith, Reverend Alan, we are praying that the grace of God will be upon them and God will increases oil upon their heads and upon their ministry in the name of jesus we thank god for all those who are church workers all the ministers in the media team the finance team all those helping out with our broadcast we salute you in the name of jesus amen so it's a pleasure to come your way again and by the grace of god we started a particular series on the place and the context of the kingdom and by the grace of God, today we are looking at the part three. I'm praying to God that to this, this would be our last session so that we can flow in other things. Now, as I mentioned the last time, what we are doing or what we are trying to do today is to provide a framework in which the message of the kingdom can be put. And we use the model of how to find objects in a particular space using the technology of GPS. And we talked about how the concept of GPS started from the basic thing we knew or we got to learn in primary being the number line, right? And we progressed into it being a graph, an X and Y axis. And if you do more physics, more mathematics, you have an X, Y, Z axis. And if you add the component of time, you are able to find objects 
in a particular environment. And with the component of time, you can even track their movement in space. Right? Now, that is how a GPS works. So, we are laying the foundation to be able to build upon several complex, several simple concepts so that we get a complex framework so that when we keep mentioning and talking about the message of the kingdom, like I keep saying, the core scripture starting from Matthew, Mark chapter 1 verse 5. Mark chapter 1 verse 5. Jesus, the Bible says that after he had endured his temptation, the first things that came out of his mouth in Mark chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 15 actually. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. Mark chapter 1 verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That means that in order for us to believe in the gospel, there must be an element of repentance. There must be an element of repentance when it comes to the kingdom because we cannot just know what the kingdom is. We must be taught. And then we look at one other scripture in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. The Bible says that when Israel got their first king, the Bible says that their prophet at the time, prophet Samuel, he explained to the people of Israel the behavior of royalty. He showed them the dynamics of kingdom life. And then he wrote it up in the book and laid it before the Lord. Hallelujah. So that is where we are coming from. That we are laying a framework so that we can understand what the kingdom is and how to navigate when we hear any other message of the gospel. Now again, this might not be what you are used to. But then for the vision of KCF and Zion Impact, this is the mandate God has given to us. So we need to set things in place so that we can navigate moving forward. Now, I thank God for um, you for joining us and thank you also for sharing the link. I pray that you'll be blessed in today's service and by the grace of God, we should end today so that we can go into other things. Now, our journey started from the book of Genesis. And we looked at several templates that God used in his attempt to communicate the mandates of the kingdom. We looked at the first template being the first man, Adam, and how he's linked to Noah, who came to redo or, with the, I mean, it's in interaction and relation with God, redo some of the things that um, went out of place because of the fall of Adam. When God found the first Adam, that was just a very simple concept. And then God had to identify in that particular lineage and find the first family to use as a template. And that first family, there was the first patriarch, Abraham, who bared forth this particular vision. And the promise of God was given to him. Out of Abraham, the promise of God to manifest the kingdom of God through the nations, the families that will be born out of Abraham was passed to Isaac and from Isaac to Jacob and then from Isaac from Jacob to the 12 sons. And before they could become a nation, the Bible makes us understand that Jacob had an encounter with God and he was given a nationalistic name, the name Israel. And the two sons, 12 sons, 12 brothers became the core pillars of this nation. Now, when God saw this nation, God incubated this nation in Egypt. And then when they were birthed forth, they became a new baby that had been born. When God saw them, they became the right template. So we got the first template nation that God decided to use to demonstrate the kingdom. Then Moses led them. He went through several stages. We liken the several stages to the work or the stages of growth for a Christian or a believer. And we realize that whilst one of the seeds that they entered into by the advice of Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, Moses set up an administration that became the first government, right? So from the first man, the first family, we look at the first patriarch, we look at the first nation, then we look at the first administration that became the first kingdom government or the template for the kingdom government. 
And then I, we also moved on to look at the journey from Exodus chapter 12 to Exodus chapter 20, where the Israelites got the law. And from that declaration, I said that the people of Israel were now the ripe kind of people or the right template for God to communicate his agenda to them. So God asked them to meet him. And the intention of God was that he would communicate the ideology, the culture of the kingdom by relationship. But the Bible makes us understand that they ran away. When they ran away on that Mount Sinai, God gave them the template of the first kingdom constitution or the template for the first kingdom manifesto. Now, I'm using the word manifesto and constitution interchangeably because what I really want to talk about is it was the first official declaration of God's intention to the people of Israel. So he was communicating, the, his decla- he was declaring his intention to them and he came out as a manifesto because he told them that if you walk before me, if you do things right, you'll be to me a kingdom of priests. You'll be a holy nation, right? And then he gave them the manifesto. Because they ran away, he gave them the codified laws that, was, that, that, that captured the behavior of the righteous relationship that God had with Abraham, right? So we look at the template for the first manifesto, the template for the first kingdom constitution, which basically becomes his declaration of intention. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we've looked at the first kingdom man, first kingdom family, first kingdom patriarch, first kingdom nation, first kingdom administration, first kingdom manifesto, first kingdom, um, the template for the first kingdom constitution, the template for the first declaration of intention. Now I want to move further and we'll do this quickly so that we can end on this particular session. We just have a few things to go. So we'll see how the Lord will do. Wherever you are, just place your right hand on your head and say, Lord, give me understanding. Let the entrance of your word bring light and understanding that Father will be communicated in our spirits and will receive the spirit of God and the life of God that in what we are studying today, Lord, will be able to express it. We pray most importantly that Father, as we learn about being flexible in our relationship with the spirit of God, Father, cause us to align the ability to quickly adjust in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So, the first kingdom constitution, it ended, the template for the first kingdom constitution ended in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Now we are not going to read that. But then we realize that when God was able to give them the first constitution, this constitution needed a further explanation because the people of God decided to run away from God. So even though there were just 10 commandments, it needed further interpretation. And that is how come we get several things in the book of Leviticus, in the book of Numbers, in the book of Deuteronomy, which was a recap. There were several laws that came out because in art, if you don't live by relationship and by intimacy, you would always be in blame. You would always be in blame. So the commandment to Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, walk before me and be blameless. The people of Israel ran away. So God had to use several means of explaining that relationship so that they would not be in error. And the more explanation was given, the more laws were given. And as I said the last time, if someone gives you a law, the person has introduced to you death because the Bible says that the letter killeth, but the spirit gives life. So anytime you give more laws, you are introducing more death more sin because there's always going to be transgression hallelujah now this moved on and then we enter into the period of the judges and now these judges sat in the capacity of the administration that moses left so they were basically those that were in charge um as the as the officials that run the government or the administration the leadership of the people of Israel. Now, this went on for a while. This went on for a while. From Joshua taking over from Moses all the way to the days of Deborah, the days of um, Shamga, the days of um, Gideon, and all of that, all the way to the days of Samson. Now, just around that time, past that time, the Bible makes us understand that now the people of God, they looked at themselves as a nation. God was still trying to communicate that you are not just a nation, you are a kingdom nation, a special people, as he said in Exodus chapter 19. 
Now, the people of Israel looked around them and they saw that there were several other nations. They engaged with them in battle. They did business with them. They were in alignment and alliances with them. They were in partnership with them. The people from the nation of Gibeon, they deceived them and entered into a pact with them. So they were in some kind of motion. So now they saw that now they were not just a family. They were a nation. And they'd seen several examples. So they came to God in the book of Fair Samuel. We are not going to look at that now. But they came to God and to their, their leader at the time, Samuel. Now, as I talked about, I said about, I talked about the judges. Now, in that same era, when there was the, the judges were leading, there were also the prophets that were also leading. So, it was always in a particular way. The judges, the priests were there, but then there were also the prophets. Now, Samuel sat in the capacity, not just as a prophet, but also as a judge of Israel. Hallelujah. So, they came to him because he was not just their spiritual leader, but he was the, he was the leader or the official that ran the administration of Israel at the time. So they came to him and said that, now go back to God and then tell God that we want a king for ourselves in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now the Bible says that when the Israelites made this demand, it smote the heart of Samuel and Samuel wept before the Lord. And one of the things that God came to say to prophet Samuel was that do not worry about what the people of Israel are saying. They have not rejected you, but then they are rejecting me as their king. Now you need to understand that that rejection came as a reason of the first thing that God said to them at Mount Sinai that you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Then God was supposed to be their leader. Now, if they asked for, as they were asking for a king, what it meant was that they were trying to overthrow the rulership and the leadership of God because now they wanted to be just like the others. Now, this also is what happens when people are born into the kingdom and God has crafted their life in the kingdom. They begin to look around and begin to adopt principles that doesn't apply to their relationship with God. So the Bible says that the children of this world and of this time, they are more wiser than the children of light because we don't want to accept the principles that work for us. The principle that works for us is that God governs our life as the only monarch, as the only royal and he begins to dictate because there is the government and the leadership of the Holy Spirit that brings structure. But then people begin to say, okay, so now this my friend, instead of... Um, asking God about this, about this. They decide to take their own step. People begin to submit heavy and serious events in their life to the opinion of their friends, to the opinion of social media, to the opinion of the movies they watch because they are looking around. Meanwhile, God says that come to me. It's a matter of intimacy. It's a matter of intimacy. Walk before me and blameless. That's what happened to the people of Israel. They looked around and they saw templates around and they said they want a king just like the nations around them. And Samuel was grieved. Samuel was grieved. Now the Bible makes us understand that so Samuel got back to the people of Israel and he said, okay, God has spoken to me. I am going to get you a king. And Samuel began to explain to them the consequences of getting a king. Now, you need to understand, the Bible talks about David as being the man after God's own heart. He was a king that was fashioned after the manner of the desires of God. Saul, on the other side, because of how the Israelites remade that request, Saul was born out of the hearts of the people. He was born out of the desires of the people. So just as David came in to fulfill the desire, the heartbeat of God, Saul was chosen to fulfill the desire and the heartbeat of the people of Israel. And that is why Saul was chosen with a particular kind of physical um, qualities. He, the Bible says that he was a head or a shoulder far above his peers. He had a particular kind of um, 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 posture that made him presentable, acceptable before the people of Israel. I get to me so far. So the Bible says that he talked to them about the implication from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. If you look at the verse number, the, if you look at the verse number 11, if you look at the verse number 11, um, the Bible says that 
this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariot and to be his husband. And some will run before him. If you go to the verse number 12, he will appoint captains over you. If you jump to the verse number 13, let's go to the verse number 13. He says, he will take your daughters to be perfumers. He will take your daughters to be cooks. He will take your daughters to be bakers. He was talking about the implication of having a man as your king. And all the way down to the verse number 14, he will take your olives. He will take your grooves. He will take your vineyard. He will take you to be his servant. And you realize that this is what happens when you enter into to the realm of kingdoms. Everything in the kingdom, someone was saying, will therefore belong to the king. The people in the kingdom will therefore belong to the king. They would no longer belong to God because when God was ruling over them as king, everything belonged to God. God established a covenant of firstborns and he says, anyone that opened the womb has been given unto me. He says that when you introduce the concept of a king ruling over a domain, that domain becomes the property of the king. A citizen owns nothing. If you own something in the kingdom, it is because of the king's benevolence. The king chooses that you have it. So the Bible says, someone decides to explain to them what it means to have a king and to be in a kingdom. The people become the subjects of the king. The lands become the property of him. The wealth of the kingdom becomes the wealth. The personal wealth of the kingdom. What the king wants to happen that is what happens. The will of the king becomes supreme. Previously, it was the will of God that was supreme. Now, the will of a man over them becomes supreme. And someone was explaining to them. And the Bible says that in the verse number 18, first Samuel 8, 18. And you will cry in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves and the Lord will not hear you. God was telling them that as soon as you get a king over you, that means that you are subject to him. And that is the whole concept of leadership, authority, the whole concept of submission. When you choose a man over you, I'm talking to you, my ladies and my, my, my sisters, when you choose a man over you, that becomes the king of your life in terms of your husband. The Bible says that he becomes Lord over you. <laughs> and it's not to scare you, but my point is that he becomes the one that dictates. If you choose someone as the leader over you, and I'm talking about leadership but that is linked to kingship, not just leadership. The person's will begins to effect. So when you choose that God should be your Lord and your Savior, you are saying that, Father, I, I reinstate you as the king of my life. And it means that the will of God should be what should be done in your life. Matthew chapter 6. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. If you choose a king over you, the king's will be done as it is in his mind, as it is in his heart. So that's what Samuel was telling them. You will cry in that day because of your king, but God will not hear you because he is now your master. The Bible says in the verse number 19, nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. He said, no, but we want a king over us. First Samuel chapter 8, verse 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us verse 20 but that we also may be like the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles amen when you are in a king and you understand the concept of a kingdom your welfare is a personal affair for the king your welfare is a personal thing for the king the king has an obligation on himself to ensure your welfare, to ensure your safety. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's what the people of Israel wanted. So we jump to the verse number, the chapter number 9. First Samuel chapter 9. Now the Bible says that, so God enacted a process to select King Saul. The Bible says that down, mention the name of King, of, of King Saul, the son of, Be of Benjamin. Now, let's skip that story because we, we know that story. Now, if you go all the way to 1 Samuel chapter 10, the Bible says that now Saul was anointed because now God had found someone. He didn't fit the desire of God. He fit the desire of the people. But God says, I can use him. Now, Saul, Saul started work, I mean, as a king. But he, because he didn't fulfill the desire of God, he was not the right template to demonstrate the kingdom king. Saul was not. 
Saul was not. David later on became the template to demonstrate the kingdom king. What it means to be a king in the kingdom. God's idea of a king. Saul unfortunately was not. But he became the first king of Israel. But then in that process, God was able to find the template for the first king. So in the chapter 10, when Saul was anointed, we realize that now someone in the in the, in the verse number 25, the Bible says that he began to explain to them the behavior of royalty. That was the first time that there was now kingdom dynamics. They were a nation, all right. They had judges, they had priests, they had prophets, but they didn't know what it meant to have, what it means to have a royal family ruling over them, a royal administration ruling over them. That is where they began to understand what it means to be part of a royal family, what it means to understand kingdom dynamics, kingdom affairs, governmental issues. It was a practical session. From the book of Exodus, chapter 19 and chapter 20. The Bible makes us understand that several generations down the line, several generations or several years down the line, God was able to find one true person called David. David became the template that God used as a kingdom king, a divine king. And God was able to demonstrate his um, idea through the life of David. So you realize that just in the same way that Abraham is exalted as the kingdom patriarch. Because I said that kingdom affair is, is family affair. So there's a family, Abraham. When it comes to the kingdom side, David became the template. Hallelujah. So we'll just jump from there quickly. Because right after that, there were a number of kings. And many of them were unable to live up to the expectation of God. But God had already found his kingdom template, King David. David was the prototype that God could use. Now, we realize that several generations down the line, just as the Bible says, that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. It's his son. We realize that as they progress after king after king, they were subdued. They were took into captivity. They rebelled. All of those things. There were remnants that were preserved. Several, several things. The Bible makes us understand that now there was now a new empire that was in place. Now you need to understand that this came from when they were in captivity from the book of Daniel. We're not going to go into that. But now the Roman Empire was in full operation at the time. The people of Israel were under the dominion of the Roman Empire. Now, the Roman Empire, even though they were not directly linked to the people of Israel because they ruled over them, they provided to God the clear prototype that talked about kingdom expansion, that talked about colonization, that talked about dominion and subduing. Because they were people who lived in Rome, but then when they invaded their territories, they did a very good job of communicating the culture of Rome to where they were. They made sure that their colonies looked exactly like Rome. They would send someone from Rome to go and administer in their colonies. Just as God was in heaven and then created a new territory, the earth, and then sent man from his side to go and administer the earth. This kingdom of Rome, the Roman Empire, was doing something like that. God saw the Roman Empire as the template for kingdom expansion. I get to me. So now it moved from just the nation of Israel, the government of Israel, and God saw it in the life of the people of the Romans. And unfortunately for them, God's cherished nation was under their dominion. It was at that time that the fullness of time had reached that Jesus needed to be born. It started from the first man, the first family, the first patriarch, the first nation, the first administration, the first kingdom dynamic thing, the first um, constitution, the first manifesto. Now there was an empire that was living it fully. They were fully living as a true kingdom, dominating other colonies, establishing their will, establishing their concept, establishing their um, understanding. Someone could have asked, why didn't God choose the kingdom of the Babylonians? Why didn't God choose the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians? At the Bible says, according by the fullness of time, God sent forth the son. It was at the right time when God saw. So God saw in the kingdom of the Romans, the Roman Empire, 
a true prototype that he could use. A true prototype that he could use. So it was at that time that Jesus was born. Now, just as God found the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, and God decided to speak to them, and then as he was speaking to them, they ran away, so they got into a lot of laws. When Jesus came, and then he had also been born into that particular era, the Bible says that he started his ministry. He was talking, repent, as he took over the baton from John the Baptist. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, the kingdom of God is at hand. But then Jesus had another beautiful encounter or opportunity, just as God had on Mount Sinai. The Bible says that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says, And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. The Bible says, and seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain. When God saw the people of Israel had come out, then he decided that I will come onto the mountain Sinai and speak to them. Jesus saw the same template and said that this is a good opportunity. God used Mount Sinai to declare his intention. He gave them a manifesto because they ran away and they couldn't walk in intimacy. They got the first constitution. Now Jesus, who was the true manifestation of the word, saw this other opportunity. He came and sat upon the mountain just like Mount Sinai and then he began to also declare his intention and he made sure he made sure that the emphasis was on the kingdom and that the requirement for living in the kingdom was far above the requirement of the law. Because that was what Mount Sinai ended in. Laws. Jesus made sure. So we are going to go through the book of Matthew from chapter 5 to chapter 7. I'm not going to talk about all of it. I'll just highlight a few things so that we can go. But I want us to look at something. Matthew chapter 5 verse 2. Look at what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 5 verse 2. The Bible says, Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Jesus was going to talk to them about the kingdom. It starts with the Beatitudes. The Bible says, He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, If the people of God, the disciples, decided to only operate with Jesus and be around him, he would not have needed to open his mouth and to say. Just as Moses went into the darkness and found God, all the disciples needed to do was to be with Jesus. So the Bible says that and Jesus chose 12. He ordained them. He appointed them. He poured oil upon them. He ordained them not into ministry, but he ordained them that they might be with him. If the people decided to be with Jesus, because that's that was saying the requirement for righteousness is intimacy. To be with Jesus, this line of scripture would have been irrelevant. But the Bible says, and he opened his mouth because they couldn't see it from his lifetime. So he said, okay, let me declare my intention and make sure that I've codified what the real intention of the kingdom should be. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and it starts, blessed are the pure, blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, kingdom of God, all the way from X, Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7. Jesus had a, a sermon and it was recorded in over three chapters because he needed to fully express and declare his intention. There was the manifesto presenting his ideology. And then he began to clarify what the kingdom constitution had to be. That the kingdom constitution was not a matter of law. It was a matter of living with righteousness in the realm of intimacy. So, if you look at his manifesto, just as God came on Mount Sinai, Jesus came on the mount, on the mountain. Just as God began to demonstrate his intention, Jesus also demonstrated his, his intention. Manifesto and constitution. So, you realize that the book of Matthew, Jesus decided to highlight certain things in the law. There are several mentions, about six mentions, where he said categorically, you have heard, but I say. You have heard, but I say. All that you have heard came from the law. Ten commandments and the explanations. You have heard, but then it says, when God said this, and this is what the law meant, there was a realm above the law. So I say, do this. So for instance, 
So we'll go through them. We'll go through them. So if you look at Matthew chapter 5, from the verse number 12 to the verse number, verse number 3 to the verse number 12, talking about the blessings of the kingdom. From the verse number 13 to the verse number 6, 6 16, talking about the values of the kingdom. Verse number 17 to the verse number 19, talking about the fulfillment of the law. Because Jesus was saying that I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. I'm trying to tell you that you can live the law and in fact live above it. Because the law, the letter kill it. That's my point. The letter kill it. But the spirit gives life. Live in the realm of the spirit. So from verse number 21, all the way down. Verse number 21, all the way down. Jesus decided to talk about, you have heard. You have heard, but I see. Mom, before we go to verse number 21, let's look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 20. Because I talked about the realm of righteousness. It's about intimacy. When, G- when God was about to explain that, they couldn't listen to it, so he gave them codified law. So, in the verse number 20, this is what Jesus said. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you obey the law, according to the Old Testament or the Mosaic law, when you obey all the law, what you get as a reward as what something that is conferred on you is righteousness. Now, that is, not, that is not what God wanted to happen. When Abraham, he didn't have the law. The Bible says that God said to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. God gave to Abraham because he obeyed the quality or the nature of righteousness. So, because they couldn't get that nature, God gave them the law. Now, when, when Jesus came in Matthew chapter 5, he says, now, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, those who get righteousness by the law, that means that you must move from the realm of righteousness of the law and move into the righteousness that Abraham had, Abraham had, which is a righteousness born out of intimacy, a realm far above the law, a realm that is intimacy with the Spirit. Unless you move into that righteousness, unless you move into that righteousness, unless you move into that righteousness, not by the law, you cannot enter into the kingdom. And that righteousness is born of what? Intimacy. Intimacy. Hallelujah. That is what God was saying. So when he made that statement, righteousness and the kingdom, then he began to explain what it meant to be, when, what it means to have the righteousness of the scribe. Because the scribe had righteousness that was born. The Pharisees had righteousness that was born as a result of their allegiance, obedience, alignment to the law. And Jesus was saying that you must have a righteousness that exceeds, that is far above that righteousness. That is when you can enter the kingdom. That is when you can enter the kingdom. So when God gave them the law, the law became a limitation and they couldn't have intimacy anymore. So Jesus came to undo that. So he started. Six things he said. You have heard, but I say. You have heard, but I say. The first one, he talked about murder. And he was talking at the context of offense and anger. So Matthew chapter 5 from verse 21 to 26. There's no need for us to look at that. But he says, you have heard that when you... Um, what's it called? He says that you have heard that you shall not murder... And whoever, Matthew chapter 5 verse 21, you have heard that you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in in danger of judgment. But it says, but I say, even when you have anger, according to the righteousness of the kingdom, you are in danger of judgment. Right? So you talk about anger. Looking at the context of offense and managing relationship. Then he moved on to you have heard from the verse number 27 to the verse number 30. He talked about adultery. He talked about that you shall not commit adultery. That he says that the righteousness of the law is low. Righteousness of the Ten Commandments is low. Move up to the righteousness of the Spirit, where it is born out of intimacy. When you look at a woman lastly, you have already committed adultery. Then he moved to the realm of divorce, that you need a certificate of divorce, and then you can send someone away. But he was no longer looking at the righteous. So when you look at the second you have heard, adultery, he was looking at the context of lust. When you move to the, sec- the third one, you have heard, number three, he was talking about divorce. Now, he was talking about having a wicked mind. Because at the time, be- the righteousness of the law said that, so far as you want to divorce, make sure that you have a certificate of divorce. And for any and every reason, you can send your, the wife of your away. But Jesus said that you must not have an evil mind. You must not be treacherous. You must not be wicked. Talking about covenants. The, co- the, the concept of evil mind, wickedness, but then basing it on covenants. Then you have heard part four. You have heard number four. He talked about swearing. He talked about what? Swearing. 
Now, in that context, he was talking about integrity. He was talking about you being truthful. You don't need an external body to swear. You must be truthful inside of yourself with God as your witness. I guess me. So, integrity and truthfulness. Because for them, so far as they lay hold on a particular symbol with someone as a witness, when they swear, it means they are telling the truth. But in Matthew chapter 5, from 33 down, it says, again, I say to you, you shall not swear falsely. You shall not swear falsely. Talking about integrity and truth. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, he talked about revenge and justice in the kingdom. That according to the righteousness of the law, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, an arm for an arm, a life for a life. He said that in the kingdom, the righteousness there is about forgiveness. Move above the realm of revenge. Dwell in the realm of forgiveness. Dwell in the realm where you can let things go. Hallelujah. Then you have heard number six. That's Matthew chapter 5 verse 43. Matthew chapter 5 verse 43. He talked about the context of love. The righteousness of the law says that love just your neighbor if your neighbor loves you. Jesus says the righteousness of the kingdom is about even loving your enemies. Loving those who are unlovable. Loving those you cannot benefit from. So he expanded the righteousness requirement of the law and says that the righteousness concept of the law just love your neighbor love those who love you but for the kingdom you must love your enemies you must bless those who curse you and you must do good to those who spitefully use you and persecute you that is the realm of the kingdom that is the realm of the kingdom so forgiveness is born out of here love is born out of here the the, the concept of tolerance is born out of here Back in the kingdom, um, in the requirement of the law, there was nothing like tolerance. Hallelujah. Now, I talked about six things that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5. And that is where it ended. These six things tackled core pillars in the law that they received on Mount Sinai. Because these core pillars shaped the interaction, shaped the behavior, shaped the culture of the people of the day. When Jesus looked at them and upgraded their requirement, he was demonstrating the pillars that the culture of a kingdom citizen should be like. The culture of a kingdom person should be like. That this is the realm in which God existed. So I know that, yes, you are a nation. You are operating by a kingdom. You have a set of rules. Things are shaping your culture. But you can't just live with the minimum mindset, minimum requirements of an honor code, minimum requirements of a constitution. Live with the constitution of heaven. Live with the constitution far above. Jesus upgraded them. The Bible says, so he fulfilled them and he upgraded. Now, in chapter 6 all the way to chapter 7, he was also talking about several things about the kingdom. So we're not going to look at that. I'll just mention them and then we go. In chapter 6, there were value systems that God was looking at. The reward system of heaven, the value system of, 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 of the kingdom. The reward system of the kingdom, the value system of the kingdom. When you look at the reward system, look at the reward system of prayer, the reward system of fasting, the reward system of giving. That is where we get Matthew chapter 6, the model prayer. That will be done as it is on earth. We look at the value system. All the way down, that is what Jesus decided to shape the priority of a kingdom person. He says, do not care about the things you eat. Don't care about the things you wear. But then seek ye first. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. The value system of the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. He shaped the priority of the people of the kingdom. Because at the time, they were not thinking about the kingdom and the, the righteousness. They were just looking at the righteous requirements of the law. But he says, seek his Seek his righteousness. That means that to come back in alignment. Come back to fellowship. Come back to intimacy. Come back to being flexible. You move with God. As God moves, you are just. As God moves, you are just. Be in front of him. Walk blamelessly. Walk before him and be blameless. The value system. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Hallelujah. Then Matthew chapter 7. This is still the sermon on the mount. He talked about a number of things. Kingdom works, judging people, a number of other things, and all of the culture. Now, I want us to look briefly at Matthew chapter 7, the verse number 12. Matthew chapter 7, the verse number 12. Now, he said, Therefore, 
whatever you want men to do for you, do also to them. For the law, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, let me explain this. Jesus summarized that when God gave the law, Ten Commandments and other things, and when they were the period of the prophets, the judges, and they all gave instruction, they were all summed up on one fundamental. If the people of Israel had understood that word intimacy, they would have gotten that fundamental. That fundamental is a fundamental called love. The law and the prophets sat on love. So he says that whatever you want men to do for you, do to them. For this is the law and the prophets. He talked about you. That's what people call the golden rule. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? So they sat on this foundation called the love. So that means that the requirement for a kingdom citizen is that you must sit not just on the law and the prophet. You must dwell in the realm of love. Dwell in the realm of love. So we are talking about you being righteous, being in alignment with God. But then there is a requirement that you must also be in alignment, dwell in alignment with your neighbor. Your vertical relationship with your neighbor, your vertical relationship with God has a direct correspondence, has a direct impact on your horizontal relationship with your man, with your neighbor. If John can say that if you say you love God, but do not love your neighbor, that you can see, then you are not even born again. You, you don't understand. You are a liar. You, you, are, you are not correct. So, the righteousness of the kingdom, the, the, the principle of the kingdom is founded. The Bible says on the law and the prophets, which is sitting on love. That law was talking about righteousness in your alignment to God, but then also in your alignment to your neighbor. Your alignment to God and your alignment to your neighbor. Your vertical relationship with God and your horizontal relationship with man. Now, when I say with God, yes. That is how come we jump into Romans chapter 14. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joining the Holy Ghost. We can talk about that later on. But I'm talking about your relationship with God and your relationship with man and what you have to play in that. We're not going to go into that. We talked about this a few weeks ago on the, the Kingdom Culture series. So you can just go and listen to that on the Zion Impact Podbean. So it says that when God was ending. When Jesus was ending his sermon on the mount, he ended by a critical statement in the chapter 12 that kingdom behavior, kingdom culture is hinged on two things. Love, which is expressed in your vertical relationship, alignment with God and your horizontal relationship with man. Vertical relationship with God, horizontal relationship with man. When I say man, your brother, your neighbor, your wife, your husband, your children, even your enemies, even those who spitefully use you, there is a way a kingdom man thinks. There is a way a kingdom man regulates his behavior. There is a way a kingdom person interacts with people. Just as you believe in God and want to be aligned, there must be another kind of alignment with other people. We are not going to go there. But then he ends that sermon on the mount by talking about the house that is built on the rock. So we get to understand that when God, when Jesus gave all this long lecture, in Matthew chapter 5, all the way to Matthew chapter 7, he ended it by saying, now the, to- the story about building your house on the rock, he says that, now, in the verse number, Matthew chapter 7, the verse number um, um, 27, verse number 27, Matthew chapter 7, the verse number 27, and the rain descended, the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat on the house, and it fell, and it was great fall. If you look at the verse number 28, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, 28, and so it was when Jesus had ended the saying that the people were astonished at his, at his teaching. The verse number 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Verse number 29, for he taught them as one having authority and not as a scribe. He ended by saying that when you receive this message of the kingdom, it means that when there's issues, and when there are issues in life, the storms of life, the winds of life, beating against the house, what I'm building, in the framework, in the context, the place of the kingdom, you will survive. The people recognize that the message of the kingdom came with an aura of authority, an atmosphere of dominion, a culture 
backed by power, not like the scribes, not like the Pharisees, because Jesus came to demonstrate what a real kingdom really was. He came to fulfill what God had been trying to do when he started with the first man, Adam. I with me so far. I with me so far. I hope you have been blessed. Hallelujah. So, we've ended, we've mirrored Mount Sinai to the mount where the Beatitudes came. Now, this message continued. Jesus did several things, several things. Always talking about the kingdom. There were several instances where he gave them parables. And the kingdom of, of, of heaven is likened unto, and he goes into it, unto, then he goes into it, a mustard seed, unto a lord, an owner of a house who was traveling, and God is seven, is likened unto someone who found treasure. The parables were ways in which Jesus could communicate different aspects of the kingdom. So this continued. Now, we are about to end. So let's just go through this briefly. Now, Jesus continued with this kingdom message after the baton was passed over from John the Baptist unto him. Using the, and it was easy for Jesus to even talk about this kingdom thing because they could easily relate to the kingdom of the Romans. They could relate to several things. He used several examples of families. Hallelujah. Several examples of lords, people who owned lands, who had servants. Because that is how God or Jesus was trying to model what the kingdom of heaven was like. So now the Bible makes us understand that now Jesus died. When Jesus died, we understand that when he resurrected, the Bible makes us understand that he continued with the same kingdom message. Now, let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts. That is where we are ending. Then we'll be done with this particular series. In the book of Acts, the Bible says that chapter 1, verse number 3. The book of Acts, chapter 1, the verse number 3. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, to whom? Now, this was a letter being written from Luke to his son, Theophilus, all the way but in the verse number three, it says, to whom he also, that he is referring to Jesus. So let me read briefly, but just focus on the verse number three. Until the former account I made, O Theophilus, for all the things that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandment to his apostles, whom he had chosen. The verse number three, to whom he also presented himself alive, after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. When Jesus was born, he came into an era where John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of God. He took over the mantle. When he came from the 40 day of fasting and, and, and prayer, the first thing he said was about the kingdom of God and he said repent. Now he had resurrected. He had died. He had resurrected. He was preparing to ascend. And the Bible says that he demonstrated, he taught them and spoke about things pertaining to the kingdom of God. After his death, he was still talking about the kingdom of God. Now, this is what happened. Because of the clear example that the Israelites or the disciples or the Hebrew nation had at the time, when Jesus was talking about kingdom, they didn't understand it. And that's what I've been saying, that you can't understand kingdom until you are taught. That is why the first verse, Mark, Mark chapter 1 verse 15 says, repent. There must be an unlearning before a relearning couldn't understand it. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 1, the verse number 6, he told them that he was talking about the kingdom of God. Then they asked, he says, you shall be baptized. Tarry. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many years, not many days from now. Acts chapter 1 verse 6, then they asked, when they heard about kingdom, they were thinking about the kingdom nation Israel. They didn't realize that God had moved from that prototype kingdom nation Israel and was not talking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, which surpasses all other things. It says, now at this time, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? He was talking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and they were talking about the kingdom of Israel. The focus of the, the, the disciples was still not ready until the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2, they got baptized as Jesus had promised. And then Peter, who stood after the baptism, and the Spirit of God gave him utterance, began to declare and to speak. And the Bible says that it was added unto them that day 
3,000 souls. When, they, when these 3,000 souls were added, they were no longer added to the kingdom of Israel. They were now added into the kingdom of God. They were added into the kingdom of heaven as Jesus had been prophesying, as Jesus has been speaking. This was now where the whole church started. So the concept of the church, the concept of the called out ones, it's linked to kingdom. It's not a matter of religion. They were born into the kingdom after they had received anointing from the spirit of God. So, I'm just going to skip all of that. But now, the message of the kingdom propagated all the way. And that's what I'm ending the book of Acts because let's talk about after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I want to end on this note. Now, the question I want to ask you because we are looking at the context of the kingdom, the place of the kingdom, how to be able to find every and any other message, how it is related to the kingdom. Like I gave the analogy, the kingdom being a reference picture of a jigsaw puzzle, you must be able to find the piece that fit together. You must be able to find the keys, the pieces that fit together. The concept of marriage should fit in the reference image of the kingdom. The concept of servanthood, sonship, Leadership should fit. Now, the question is, what does the kingdom message look like? What does the kingdom message look like? Because you say that, okay, when Jesus preached, yes, Jesus preached the kingdom, kingdom, kingdom. But then, okay, there's also another powerful message, the message of love. There's also another powerful message, the message of salvation. Another powerful message, the message of advancing, um, there might be the message of service. And I'm saying that they all fit into the framework of the place or the context of the kingdom. With the message of the kingdom being anchored, just like a GPS device, you can find where every other thing falls in place. Hallelujah. So what does the kingdom message look like? I want us to look at the book of Acts chapter 8, the verse number 12. Listen to what the Bible says. The disciple had grown. They had gotten people that they were, they formed an administrative structure. And there was one man who was called among many to serve tables. The man, Stephen. And in this case, the man, Philip. The Bible says that as there was persecution in the church, they spread. Now, Philip went into the land of Samaria. Now, if the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of God had not migrated from just the template of Israel, nobody would have gone to Samaria. Nobody would have gone to the Gentile world. Nobody would have gone to the people who are not Israelites. But Philip, because now they were now in the realm, not just of the kingdom of Israel as a template, but then Jesus had come to establish his kingdom. Now they could go into the regions of the Samaritans. So in Acts chapter 8, the verse number 12, the Bible says, Philip had done his work evangelism, crusades, preachings, teachings, and he had won the whole nation, the whole region of the Samaritans. The Bible says in the verse number 12, but when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both of them, men and women, were baptized. Look at what the Bible says in the verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized. Now, if you need to understand, so let's go back. What does it mean when the Bible says that he preached the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus? You need to understand, so what was the message that Philip preached? Let's jump to the book of Acts chapter 8, the verse number 4. Acts chapter 8, the verse number 4. We'll go to the verse number 4, the verse number 5, the verse number 6, the verse number 8. The Bible says in the verse number 4, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. I talked about the persecution. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached who? Christ to them. He preached what? Christ to them. The verse number 6. And the multitude, with one accord, heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. The verse number 7. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, 
came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. The verse number eight, and there was great joy in the city. That is my cause, my, my, my focus. The Bible says in the verse 12 that Philip preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. When you look at the verse number 4, the verse number 8, it's elaborated. What does the kingdom mean? What does the name of God mean? He says that he preached to them Jesus Christ. He preached to them and there was people, there were people who had unclean spirits who were being set free. There were people who were demon possessed and they were being liberated. There was the casting out of unclean spirit. There was deliverance taking place. There was healing taking place. There was the ministration of the spirit. The Bible says that, and they were filled with great joy, ministration of the spirit of God. Hallelujah. So the message of the kingdom cannot just be put in a corner as just a message on itself. That's what I'm saying that is the context. There was deliverance being preached. There was healing being preached. There was um, ministration of the spirit of God being preached. There was there was there was there was clarity coming coming in. There was there was there were things about their relationship with God. There were things about being born again. There were things about being be, be, being a right kingdom person. There were things about not just behavior modification but life transformation. This was the message of the kingdom. We could see deliverance, casting out of unclean spirit. There were miracles. There were healings. Ministration of the spirit. So in all of these, you realize that preaching, teaching, healing, deliverance, praying, um, all of these things become pieces of a juggle puzzle that you can fit together. And when you put all of them together, the image or reference picture that you get is the image of the kingdom. Oh, are you with me? Are you with me? Are you with me? With all of this, you can realize that, okay, when you preach a message, Especially for people in KCF and Zion Impact, you can you should be able to, like a GPS receiver, know your location in the context of the kingdom. We are talking about marriage, you should see where marriage fits in the kingdom. We are talking about leadership, you see where le- leadership fits. We are talking about your business. You want to work in a company as an employee, you should know how a kingdom person in the kingdom should operate as an employee. As a business owner, you should know how to operate in the kingdom. It all should be. It's the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And there was healing. There was miracle. There was the ministration of the spirit. There was deliverance. There was casting out of unclean spirit. Why are you with me? The mission of the kingdom becomes the framework. Are you with me? So, let's look at one other example in the book of Acts. Now, the Bible says that in the book of Acts chapter 14, the verse number 22, Paul decided to look at one other aspect of the kingdom, talking about the difficulties of the kingdom, the hard life of the kingdom. Jesus talked about narrow of narrow is the way, hard is the path. The way of the kingdom is a holy way. Now, I'm using the word holy because the Bible says that in the book of um, Exodus, it says that you shall be unto me a special people, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. We looked at the last time, holiness being set apart. It's a different kind of life. So Paul, after he had experienced persecution, both from the people in his camp, both from the people um, that were around him and people he didn't know, people he had been sent to, to minister, he said in Acts chapter 14, verse 22, Acts chapter 14, verse 22, that, let me start from the verse number 21, Acts chapter 14, verse 21. And when... They had preached the gospel to the city and made disciples. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. The verse number 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must. If the Bible is yours, underline. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, let's pause there. Now, I'm saying that the kingdom, the way into the kingdom is a narrow and a hard. The words of Jesus, not my words. But what I'm saying is that it's a holy, that means it's a distinct path. And Paul is saying that we must by, we must too many tribulations enter the kingdom. Now, what it means is that there is a way that other thing, other, other systems of this world flow. The whole world, God didn't use the whole world as a template to demonstrate his kingdom. After the fall of man, God decided to pick 
prototypes until the arrival of Jesus with the prototype of the Roman Empire. When Jesus came, he was under the kingdom of the Roman Empire. But yet, he demonstrated the kingdom of heaven. So, and one of the things that Jesus said is that the kingdom of God is neither here nor there, but it's in us. It says that, and when you see the signs, there's deliverance, there is the casting of our spirit, there, there, there's the brutal attack on the kingdom of darkness, then you know that by the finger of God, by the power of God, the kingdom of God is being demonstrated. So you realize that God is not just interested in the whole world and establishing his kingdom. Because you need to understand that when the fall happened, the whole world and everything in it was relegated or given, handed over to the kingdom of the enemy, the kingdom of the devil. So the Bible talks about the ruler of this age, the ruler of the earth. So where the kingdom of God is it is through the people that decide to make god their king the people that decide that the will of heaven the will of the king the will of the kingdom is what they will live by so because of that you are in a place where you are in opposition to the natural occurrences the natural flow the natural system around you so the bible says that through much tribulation because people will not understand when you decide to be a kingdom person it doesn't make sense i said it already it doesn't make sense people will work hard at attacking you and one of the most bitter attack that you would have is the attack from religious people people who don't have an understanding of kingdom but they have understanding of religion because in their mind when god started god was creating religion god was not creating religion I'm not going to talk about what relation, the relationship between religion and kingdom. God is not talking about that. But the people who were, that were persecuting Christ were the people that were persecuting the church. Paul, he confessed that he was a zealous religious person. A Pharisee. Blameless. On point. He was attacking the kingdom until he became a person who propagated the kingdom. And the same people that he moved out from attacked the kingdom. If you are a Christian, your first disposition is that you are not a religious person you are not a religious person you are an official of the kingdom you behave as an official you are a member of a royal family there are ways royals behave you must be taught the behavior of royalty you are not a religious person when you are praying don't pray from the realm of okay i must do this prayer six times i must do this prayer seven times i must do no you pray from the realm of relationship you pray from the realm of okay i'm a kingdom official and i must administer the affairs of the kingdom you pray from the realm of i'm talking to my father it's a matter about family relationship you can cry before god because god is your father pour out your heart before him you can declare and stand and decide that you will bind on earth and be bound in heaven as a judge as a kingdom ruler not as a religious person when you are fasting you must understand what it means in the kingdom when you are giving you must understand what it means in the not just give don't just fast fast with a right mindset kingdom mindset when you are entering into a relationship enter and choose carefully not because your heart is moving look at the purpose kingdom where your your relationship your marriage fits in the business duties the business affairs of the kingdom when you are being sent to a, a nation for school for family for vacation see where it fits in the kingdom see where it fits for the bible says through much tribulation we enter into the kingdom so when you enter into it know your place be rightly aligned find your place in the three-dimensional space of the kingdom make sure that your gps location is constantly receiving signals from heaven make sure that you are in the right place with the right heart right mindset to declare to advance to propagate to spread the affairs of your kingdom the mandate of your king through much tribulations and difficulty we enter into the kingdom then we'll look at two last scriptures they will be out of here and in fact i'll just um sum all of them up into yeah two last scriptures i'll mention three of them but just read acts chapter 19 verse 8 
Acts chapter 20, verse 25, and Acts chapter 28, verse 23. So let's look at Acts chapter 19, verse 8. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. The Bible says, now, let's start from the verse number 7. Acts chapter 19, verse 7. Acts chapter 19, verse 7. Now, the men were 12 in total. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. It continues. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, Paul went into Ephesus and he established a church. And the people of Ephesus at the time, the Bible says that Paul took his time. For three months, he was going into the synagogue. The Bible says that he debated with them. He reasoned with them. He persuaded, with, he persuaded them so that they would understand the things of the kingdom. And that's what I'm saying. The things of the kingdom don't just come automatically. You must be taught. That's why Jesus started by repent. He says he persuaded them. That means that the message of the kingdom is an expensive message. It needs capacity from you receiving from God because you are communicating the mindset of God to be able to translate it to the mind and the hearts of the people. It's an expensive effort. The people who are receiving the message of the kingdom, they are not used to the kingdom. Especially in this 21st century period. The concept of the kingdom is an alien thing. It's an abominable thing. It's, a, it's, it's something that people are moving against. You need to persuade. You need to reason. You need to con consider. You need to debate. And first of all, this must happen with you. You must realize that your natural flow of life must shift. You must be persuaded to tap into the flow of the kingdom. You must be persuaded to tap into the government of the spirit of God. That this is how I am. This is how I behave. This is my knowledge. This is my emotions. This is how I action. This is how I react. But because of the kingdom of God, I must be persuaded. I must be debated. God must have rulership over me that I side with the kingdom of God. Oh, are you with me? Are you with me? I hope you are learning something. The Bible then talks about Acts chapter 20, verse 25. He came back to the people of Ephesus and said that he was not going to meet them again. Let's jump that one. Now, let's end in Acts chapter 28, the verse number 23. Acts chapter 28, the verse number 23. Acts chapter 28, the verse number 23. Now, let's look at the verse number 22 first. Acts chapter 28, the verse number 22. Now, Paul was continuing his ministry. He moved from Ephesus. He was in Rome. A number of other things. Paul was at this point in time relaxing a bit. The Bible says he had gotten himself a house, I believe. He was working. He was taking care of himself. Now, at this point in time, he was no longer going into the temple. Now, people were coming to him in his house. The Jews, the people of Rome, and he was still doing the same thing of persuading, teaching, debating. So the Bible says in the verse number 22 that the people said, if you read from the verse number 21, that we neither receive letters from Judea concerning you or reports of people speaking evil about you. But the verse number 22, he says, but we desire to hear from you what you think for concerning the sect. We know that it is spoken against everywhere. When Paul was establishing it, it says that we know that this thing that you are doing, forming the cliques, the churches that were being born, they were not being born because of religion. They were being born as a result of the church. The church is an offspring of a kingdom. They were not being born as a result of religion. They were being born as a result of kingdom. As they were being born, it says people are speaking against it everywhere. The verse number 23, the Bible says, so when they had appointed him a day. Many came to him at his lodging. So Paul was in a place where he was chillaxing. Now people were coming to him. To whom he explained. Paul explained and he solemnly testified of the kingdom of God. The Bible says then he did the same thing again. He persuaded them concerning Jesus 
both from the law of Moses and the prophets, the Bible says, from morning till evening. In the verse number 24, the Bible says that some of the people that he spoke to, they were persuaded. But some people, they were still in disbelief. He persuaded them from morning till evening. The things that concerned the kingdom, he testified, he explained, he solemnly explained, testified, persuaded them the things of the kingdom and the things concerning Jesus. From the law of Moses and from the prophets, from morning till evening. Some believed, some did not believe. So my first question, what does the kingdom message look like? I explained from the book of Acts chapter 8. The kingdom message is about kingdom. Talking about Jesus. Christ is being preached. There are miracles happening. There are deliverance happening. Casting off unclean spirit. There are healings. There's the ministration of the spirit. Paul also went through the same thing. Talking about the kingdom. Exalting Jesus from the law and from the prophets. The Bible says he testified solemnly of the kingdom. So what I'm trying to say today as I bring my message to an end. Is that your encounters in the word of God, your encounters with the spirit of God, when you try to locate it in this, not just a three-dimensional space, because in three, three-dimensional space, X, Y, Z, there might be many dimensions. There are many aspects of God. There are many things in the spirit, in the spirit realm. When you're trying to locate all of this, what I want you to have in mind is that where do I place it? In the kingdom of God. So that you can live your life as a kingdom official. You can live your life as a member of the royal family. So that things will not just be, it will not just be like you are hearing messages and things are out of context. Things are contradictory. But everything fits well in place. When you look at the framework of the, of the place of the kingdom or the context of the kingdom. It provides an environment that you can find things. The message of the kingdom is about Christ. The message of the kingdom is about Jesus Christ. The message of the kingdom is about Jesus. It's about exalting Jesus from the, from the law of Moses. It's about exalting Jesus from the prophets. It's about exalting Jesus from the gospels. In that exaltation, you would see teaching. You would see preaching. You see keys of giving keys of prayer. You see deliverance. You see kingdom warfare. You see healings. You see the ministration of the spirit. But all of it is based on what you're exalting. Your righteous relationship with the king of the kingdom and your relationship with the people around you. That is what a kingdom man should be. That is what a kingdom business should be. Are you aligned to heaven? And are you doing right by the people? As a business, are you aligned to heaven? And are you doing right by the people? As a husband, are you aligned to heaven? And are you doing right by your wife? Are you doing right by your family? As an employee, are you aligned to heaven? And are you doing right by your boss? Are you doing right by your employer? As an employer, are you doing right by heaven? And are you doing right by your employees? As a president, as a minister, as, as, as a, 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 someone in politics, are you doing right by heaven? And are you doing right by your citizens? By your country people. As a pastor. As a shepherd. As a minister of the gospel. Are you doing right by God? And are you doing right by the church? Are you doing right by the souls that have been committed into your hands? Are you doing right by them? As a church worker. Are you doing right by God? And are you doing right by the church? Are you doing right by your duties? Are you doing right by your team members? As a student. Are you doing right by God? And I'm doing right by your classmates. I'm doing right by your lecturer. I'm doing right by your, your school. As a business person, are you doing right? First of all, righteousness to the king in your relationship and who you are. That we cannot things. Go and look at the kingdom message on culture and you understand. Are you doing right? There is a relationship. Jesus broke it down on the mount. On, 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 on the Mount of Beatitudes. He explained what your relationship with God should be. He explained what your relationship with man should be. It was all sponsored by the Spirit of God. Because everything about the kingdom is premised on relationship. Which an offspring of it becomes righteousness. I don't know if you've learned anything today. But as we wrap up, I pray that God will locate you. I pray that 
the grace of God. Let's just look at this briefly. Romans chapter 14, the verse number 14. Let's, let's pray with that. Let's pray with that scripture. Romans chapter 14, the verse number 14. The Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. I pray that you would experience the righteousness of the kingdom. I pray that you would experience the peace of the kingdom. I pray that you would experience the joy of the kingdom. Most importantly, I pray that because we've talked about the place in the context of the kingdom, you would be found in the Holy Spirit. You will be found in the kingdom of God, being sponsored, your actions being sponsored by the Spirit of God. Your mind being sponsored by the Spirit of God. Your interaction being sponsored by the Spirit of God. Your culture being sponsored by the Spirit of God. Your relationship being sponsored by the Spirit of God. Because the people of Israel could not, because they left God out of the picture. When Jesus came, he says, you need the Spirit of God. So he told the disciples, tarry ye unto receive power. The people couldn't understand the kingdom as they talked about the kingdom of Israel until the Holy Spirit came and they understood the message of the kingdom. They understood the message of the kingdom. You need the Holy Spirit. You need those because at this point in time, in the era in which we are, the governor that has been sent from the kingdom of heaven to administer the affairs of the kingdom here is primarily the, the Holy Spirit. He's the governor of the kingdom here. So if he's administrating your life, he's not just saying, I know the Holy Spirit should be a personal friend personal buddy buddy but he comes in the capacity of a kingdom official he comes in the capacity of a kingdom royal and he begins to structure your life i pray that your life will be structured will be fueled by the life in the spirit of god so he says the kingdom of god is not eating and drinking but righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit i pray that your relationship with god will be restored in the area of your life where there's been a cut where there's been a separation I pray that God will locate you. As I pray for you, I stretch out my hands to you and I declare that may the right hand of God be stretched to you. May your life be sponsored by the Spirit of God. May your health be sponsored by the kingdom of God. May your wealth be sponsored by the Spirit of God. May your understanding be sponsored by the Spirit of God. May your relationship be sponsored by the Spirit of God. May you move into the realm of the law of the Spirit where you are far above the realm of the law. Of sin and of death. Where you live righteously, holy, in, 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 holy, in holiness, in godliness, effortlessly. Forgiving people effortlessly. And um, 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 tolerating people effortlessly. And um, 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 serving God effortlessly. Praying, maintaining your religion effortlessly. Because you are sponsored by the Spirit of God. Pray that God will locate you. God will locate your family. God will give you understanding and that your place in the kingdom will be firmly established in the name of Jesus. God bless you for joining us. It's a privilege and an honor to come to you one more time. I pray that as we've ministered this word in these three part series, I pray that you receive from God the understanding. You will not enter into the realm of behavior modification. No. But you will enter into the realm of life transformation not just behavior modification you are not trying to modify your behavior we are trying to transform your life you must have the life of the kingdom you must have the life the nature the kingdom life transformation is our goal not behavior modification so if we are saying that don't do this it's not because we are trying to modify we want to transform paul says in romans chapter 12 but renew your mind with the word let there be transformation let there be transformation by the renewing of your mind. It's life transformation, not behavior modification. Hallelujah. God bless you. And will come your way again when God gives us grace. Love you plenty. There will be a mobile money number on your screen. I encourage you to send in an offering. Send in a seed. Connect to the altar and to the grace of God flowing right here. At the altar of Zion Impact Teshi Branch Glory Mount. I pray that you receive in full everything that is due you. May the grace of God sponsor your life and may the Spirit of God sponsor your work in the kingdom. In the name of Jesus, we love you.
And we send you love also from our apostle, Apostle Kingsley J. Godson. In Jesus' name, amen. See you again next time.